Hello, welcome to the discussion what the virtual summit between President Joe Biden and President Xi Jinping means for the rest of the world. This event is hosted by Committee of 100 in conjunction with FMC, former members of Congress. For those of you familiar with Committee of 100, welcome back. For those of you new to Committee of 100, welcome. Committee of 100 is a nonprofit membership organization of Chinese Americans across business, government, academia, and the arts. The organization's dual mission is to promote the full participation of all Chinese Americans in American society and advancing the constructive dialogue and relationships between the peoples and leaders of the United States and greater China. FMC, the Association of Former Members of Congress, is a bipartisan nonprofit voluntary alliance of former United States senators, representatives, and delegates. FMC utilizes the vast public policy experience of its over 700 members to provide cultural exchange and civic education programs, both at home and abroad, promoting a collaborative approach to policymaking. Should you have a question today, please utilize the Q&A function and type your question there. If time allocates, we will get to as many questions as possible. Now, allow me to introduce our moderator for today's discussion, who will introduce our esteemed panelists from FMC. Robert G is the president of G Strategies Group, a Washington DC consulting firm, providing policy analysis, advocacy, and litigation support for investors, trade associations, utilities, renewable energy companies, independent power companies, and public institutions. A 40-year veteran of the energy industry, Robert has served as an attorney, senior state and public official, and technology executive, combining the fields of law, public affairs, technology, and finance required to address the challenges of global and U.S. domestic energy markets. From 1997 to 2000, Robert served as Assistant Secretary for Policy and International Affairs and as Assistant Secretary for Fossil Energy for the U.S. Department of Energy in Washington, D.C. Robert serves as the D.C. Regional Chair for Committee of 100. Robert, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you, Charles. And I want to extend a warm welcome to all of our guests this afternoon. Uh, and I also want to join Charles in, on behalf of the Committee of 100, thanking our partner for this webinar, the Association of Former Members of Congress. Together, we and FMC have co-sponsored several webinars along with multiple in-person breakfast briefings on Capitol Hill on topics of significant importance to congressional leadership. What brings us together today is the summit just concluded between President Joe Biden and the President of the People's Republic of China, Xi Jinping. Less a summit and more a conversation this event marks the second time these leaders have met since President Biden assumed office. For those who followed US-Sino US relations since the early 90s, it has been a journey that has been uplifting at times and frustrating in others. But there remains little doubt that over the most recent years, relations between the two countries in its most important bilateral relationship for both has been marked by conflict. The previous administration under President Trump launched a trade war with tariffs and imposed a string of dramatic measures in his final year in office that included forcing the Chinese consulate in Houston to close. Yet currently under President Biden, while the tone has shifted, the previous administration's actions, particularly on tariffs, have not. So as I say in the nuanced diplomatic language used in Washington, relations are, quote, in a ditch. Close quote. This formed the backdrop of this summit. Based on official reporting, just what occurred? The White House arranged this meeting setting expectations low. Just the occurrence of the meeting, which ran for three and a half hours, was hailed as noteworthy. At its conclusion, there was no joint statement and no deliverables were announced other than changes to visa terms for journalists in both countries that had been a source of tension. The White House news release quoted the president as saying that their joint, quote, responsibility as leaders is to ensure that the competition between our countries does not veer into conflict, whether intended or unintended, close quote. Specifically, President Biden's goal was to, quote, establish some common sense guardrails, close quote. The issues they discussed included China's practices in Xinjiang, Tibet and Hong Kong, as well as human rights more broadly. On Taiwan, 
President Biden reiterated the importance of the one China policy, but was direct in his concerns about Chinese behavior that threatened stability in the Taiwan Strait. On trade, the president stressed the need to ensure the rules of the road for the 21st century advance an international system that is free, open, and fair. President Biden did outline several areas of needed cooperation with China, which included climate change, health security, specifically related to COVID-19, curbing the North Korea's, North Korea's ballistic missile development program, and prodding Iran back into compliance with an international accord on its nuclear program. On the opposite side of the pond, as they say, China's state news agency Xinhua cited President Xi as saying, if Taiwan independence forces take provocative moves or cross China's red lines, China will have to take, quote, decisive measures. More broadly, President Xi said he hoped Biden would bring U.S. policy toward China back to a, quote, rational and pragmatic track, close quote, and that the U.S. and China should respect each other's interests, rights, and systems, and avoid playing a zero-sum game. President Xi likened China and the United States to two giant ships at sea, each needing to be steered steadily to avoid losing speed or colliding. To help us decipher this event and for insights into the reactions in Washington, we are pleased to have two seasoned policy and political experts today from the ranks of former members of Congress. Both served six terms in Congress, which means that their combined service cumulatively totals about a quarter century. Before I introduce them, a program note, as Charles mentioned, if viewers wish to ask a question, please type it into the chat box where we will endeavor to answer them during the period following our discussion. So let, let me introduce our speakers. From 1999 to 2011, the Honorable Brian Baird represented the third congressional district of Washington state. In Congress, he chaired the Science and Technology Subcommittees on Energy and the Environment and the Research, Technology and Education Subcommittee. He also served on the House Budget, Transportation and Infrastructure and Small Business Committees. A doctorate in clinical psychology, he practiced clinically for 20 years, taught graduate courses on research and statistics, has written three books, served as a university president, and was an advisor to the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. Our other speaker is as follows. From 2007 to 2019, the Honorable Peter Roskam represented the 6th Congressional District of Illinois. In Congress, he served in the House leadership as the Chief Deputy Whip for the Republican Caucus and chaired three major subcommittees of the House Ways and Means Committee. He also served on the House Financial Services Committee and the Domestic and International Monetary Policy, Trade, and Technology Subcommittee. He chaired the U.S. Democracy Partnership, a bipartisan commission supporting emerging democracies abroad, and co-chaired the Korea Caucus, the India Caucus, the Bipartisan Task Force to Combat Anti-Semitism, and the Republican Israel Caucus. Now, gentlemen, you both heard my high-level description of the summit. My opening question to you both is, what significance of, if any, does this meeting hold? And how do you think the current members of Congress regard this event, along with their general opinion of U.S.-China relations? We aren't looking, as, as, and I want to caution, we're not looking for a, quote, correct answer. <laughs> we grade on an essay. So let's proceed alphabetically by last name. Congressman Baird, you go first. Well, thanks, Bob. It's such an honor to be with you and with the Committee of 100 and my colleague and friend, Peter Roskam. Uh, there is no more important relationship on the planet today than the US and China. So we need to start there. And the fact that President Biden reached out to uh, President Xi is really important. Uh, I don't expect that we'll come emerge from these conversations immediately with some grand announcement, and I think that would be unrealistic. But having at least a communicative relationship between our president and the president of China is, is existentially important, and I mean that in, in the deepest sense of that word. So that's a good thing. 
uh, the challenges, you know, you, you use the analogy, Bob, of, of the relationship being in the ditch. I think it's a good analogy. If, if, if your car is in the ditch, which our relationship is, and one side's trying to push it out and the other's trying to push it back, you're not going to get very far. And it seems like probably from both perspectives, each country feels the other side's trying to push their car back into the ditch. And what we really have to do, I think, as President Biden said, really, is find areas of common ground like climate, like uh, uh, international security, like uh, health, health issues like COVID, and find ways to work together. So I'm hopeful that this will be the beginning of a constructive relationship and that we can get past some of the vitriolic rhetoric of recent years and move both nations for the sake of the world in a better direction. Thank, thank you, Congressman uh, Baird. Uh, Congressman Roscom. Yeah, I'm delighted to be here as well, Bob, and uh, to be with Brian and to un try and unpack some of these things. Um, so let me take a step back and then take a glance forward as well. So the, the glance back is to look at the shift that has happened on a bipartisan basis in the United States about our relationship with China. I remember watching the debate between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, and in one of the debates, it was clear that both of those presidential nominees had decided to pull the US out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Now, what was really interesting was they were representing a core value in both parties. That's a big shift. And um, moving forward, the, the subtext of that discussion, and I, I personally think it was a mistake to do that, but the subtext of that discussion was that this was perceived as a, quote, anti-China move. Now, fast forward you know, to, to today and, and look at where we are. I, I'm literally, I'm looking out at, at the US Capitol across the street and in a deeply divided Congress, in a time when people can hardly agree about what time of day it is, there is a consensus that the US Chinese relationship is no longer a relationship of cooperation primarily, but really the, the Chinese are perceived by Capitol Hill as to be strategic adversaries. That's a shift. So in answer to your question, was it, you know, what, what do we take out of the summit? To Brian's point, we take out of the summit that it's a good thing when leaders talk, when, when they are having conversation, when they are working up agendas, when they're forced to look at one another and so forth. And while, while that isn't necessarily, you know, a prelude for great things to come, it's also a restraining influence for some nonsense that could end up happening. So I think everyone, I think the, the, the White House, to your point, set the expectations fairly low and the expectations were met. I mean, the walk of the, the two great, you know, the, the, the leaders of the two biggest economies in the world get together and the takeaway is a discussion about visas for journalists. I mean, <laughs> you know, just, just de minimis. But to Brian's point, it's good that they're talking but they've got a lot to talk about. And, you know, even in preparation for today, you know, the, the news was changing by the hour. You know, it's just like you, you, you put into your search engine, China hit news. And, you know, every 43 minutes, there's something that's significant that's been happening just in this short period of time. Thank you. And, and, and uh, Congressman Roscom, you did touch upon what you understand to be the current uh, temperature among members of Congress, which there is a, unusual degree of unanimity uh, and, and like mind on US-China relations. Now, there may be some differences and nuances on specific issues, but generally the tone and tenor uh, is, is one of negativity as I, as I take uh, your, your remarks. And, and I, I'm, let, me, let me turn to Congressman Baird. Is, is, are you hearing the same thing? A absolutely. The thing is, I think China is seen by by both sides of the aisle, maybe almost all Americans, as, as both a significant economic competitor and an ideological threat and possibly a military threat. And on the ideology front, you know, we, we have fundamental values that are at odds with China. Uh, the First Amendment being the most prominent example I can think of. Freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly, freedom to petition the government for redress of grievance. We believe that's fundamental to a healthy society. And we don't see that reflected in China. There's also great concern about the expansionism of the Belt and Road Project and of the, the way Hong Kong has been treated, the threats to Taiwan. 
etc. So there, there's a combination of ideological difference, economic competition, and potential military threat that's alarming all sides of the aisle, and I think all Americans. So let me let me turn to you both then and say, it, it, since we, you know, it's no secret that there, there there are two different systems at play. I mean, there's a U.S. system, uh, democratic system that we we champion and and hold dear and, and project to the world, and then obviously the Chinese as a one party uh, system has been for, since uh, the inception of the uh, founding of the Chinese Communist Party, and and the control that they have exercised since since 1950. So that that's been that's been unchanged in our dealings with contemporary China for decades now. What is different today versus where we were, say, 30 years ago in the 1990s, when there was at least some optimism that perhaps but that by embracing China and bringing it uh, uh, forward as a, as a member of the family of nations and allowing it to join the World Trade Organization, what, where, where did we? Where was there a disconnect, let's say, between uh, the United States expectations of what we thought China could become versus where we think they are today? And I just thought that open to you both to, to opine and share your thoughts. I think it's an unfair criticism to, to criticize the West and to criticize American policymakers for being hopeful about China. It was not irrational. It wasn't a crazy thing to say, hey, look, if we reach out in this way and if we invite them into the World Trade Organization and create these norms and so forth, then um, out of that will come, uh, will, will, will come a, number one, a flourishing relationship, and number two, freedoms, et cetera, the types that Brian just mentioned, will flourish in, in China. That, that was not irrational. Turned out it was wrong. It didn't work. And, um, and, you know, that, that, that is to say that now we, we, we're, we're more clear-eyed about the nature of the, the, the Chinese system, what their goals are, and, and how they're moving, moving about the world. And it's an interesting thing, you know, as members of Congress, Brian and I were able to travel and interact with world leaders and then, you know, folks who were not at the at the top of their, you know, leadership structures in their countries, but were, you know, business people and, and, and so forth. And the ability to see how the U.S. is perceived around the world vis-a-vis -vis now China in some of these cases is really quite remarkable. So if you look, unfortunately, at, at some of the fallout for how the Chinese approached Sri Lanka, for example, um, pretty aggressive moves, pretty aggressive, you know, takeover of a port and so forth. And um, the U.S., when, when we're interacting around the world and when most of our Western allies are interacting around the world, it's not with that sort of um, sharp elbowed diplomacy. But um, the, the nature of the relationships right now that China is, is asserting and, and courting in Africa, for example, I think are jarring for a lot of American diplomats and a lot of other Western diplomats. And there's, there's kind of an awakening and, and a sense of clarity. So again, when you, have, when you have a country that has become the focal point in arguably the most divided Congress in the last quarter century for sure, but this one issue brings Republicans and Democrats across the spectrum together, that's really telling you something in terms of a pivotal point in this relationship. That's a, a great observation you make. Let me try to take that observation and kind of turn it around inward towards the United States. And, and let me just throw this question at you both. Um, to what extent do you think that the internal political differences that have become so manifest domestically in the United States, has that in some respects hobbled the United States' ability to project its own value system uh, and, vert and value attributes overseas? That's kind of part one. Part two, I'll, I'll cite you an example. It's a small one because this is something that I deal with uh, in my daily life as an energy professional. But I did follow what was going on over at the uh, COP26 in Glasgow. And it seemed as though President Xi was telling the United States, you know, 
why should we go along with whatever pledges the United States is going to make on carbon emissions when you guys can't keep your own promises because you have changes in administrations? You know, you joined the Paris Accord under President Biden. You got out of it under President Trump. Now you're back in under President Biden. I mean, is there some argument that he might be able to make that our own system on its own may manifest some type of at least from the outside observer, observer, rightly or wrongly, some types of weaknesses that would impair our ability to have influence? Well, I, I, you know, I, I think there's no question about it. To, to, to my way of thinking that there's, and what I've been observing in my travels, there is grave concern among the progressive democratic world, uh, a free, free enterprise, free market, free idea, ideology, democ democratic world about the divisions in the United States and our shift in, in some very negative directions in recent years. That then plays into the hands of autocrats around the world. It's not just China, it's Russia, it's, it's Hungary, it's, it's Turkey, it's lots of other places that point to dysfunction in our co country. And the January 6th events were astonishing. The people never imagined that Americans would attack their own capital. So there's no question that we've weakened ourselves, I think, in the eyes of the world, and that we're seeing uh, countries like China and Russia and others, first of all, fomenting some of that, uh, that certainly in the case of Russia, fomenting those divisions through its, its, its uh, troll farms and its internet inter interference. But there's two other things that I think are really important. First, you know, you ask what has changed, Bob, uh, a minute ago, and Peter hit the nail on the head in so many of the ways. I, I think many members of Congress and certainly the American public would be shocked by two things. One, the extraordinary technological capacity that exists within China. Their scientists are every bit as, as solid and, and, and accomplished and, and, and producing very unique and important discoveries. And their technological firms are, are just breathtaking. When you visit some of the firms, the people on this call know well, but I don't think most Americans do. So the first thing is China's stature economically, militarily, and in other ways has far advanced beyond what most Americans appreciate. The second is the virulence of the Chinese anti-American rhetoric lately, whether it's in the popular media or in speeches by the president or, or just how America gets portrayed. When you travel in the world and you're able to tune in directly to, to Chinese television, you can see that. And so those two trends, an increasingly powerful uh, nation of the scale and size of China and its population and geography, and the virulence of the anti-American and anti-democratic rhetoric are hugely problematic. You know, let me go at that that question because I think it's I think Brian raises some some important aspects of it and I'd like to I'd, I'd like to highlight some of them. I will stipulate and I think Brian would stipulate <clears throat> that that we we're in a troubled season or we're we're in the midst of a of a troubling season. But we're openly discussing it. Our press is openly reporting on it. We are openly reflecting on it. And that's one of the great strengths of the United States. It's one of the great strengths of the West. We don't see that coming out of China. We see critics who are shunned, critics who disappear, tennis players who disappear. Yeah, yeah I mean, the, just the whole, the whole litany of issues that are, that are so significant. The other thing to be mindful of is this, um, what, 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 we're, what we're competing around is, is basically an, an invitation. And I think I, I go back to the fourth century and let me, let me, let me throw a, a quote from St. Ambrose your way. St. Ambrose said, and this was in the context of his faith, he said, we don't impose on the world, we propose a more excellent way. And I think that that's what we're doing right now. And yeah, we're wrestling with hard things in the United States and our Western allies are wrestling with hard things and difficult voices. But I have a great deal of confidence that when it all settles down, these great values, these things that bring us together as Americans, these uh, constitutional rights that are so dear and precious to us will prevail. And I think that this great competition of ideas, we're not a stranger to this. We've seen this in other contexts. We've seen it in the Cold War context. We saw it in the context of fascism. We've seen it throughout history, but this is a great competition of, of, of ideas. And, and we've got our work cut out for us from a competitive point of view. So what I'm hearing is, despite uh, the open ventilation of our sharp differences, what uh, distinguishes our system 
from that of the Chinese system is transparency and openness for better or for worse, where we can agree, we can disagree with one another in, a, in very public ways, and we do. You need just turn on, uh, you know, go on the internet or uh, <laughs> turn on your network uh, cable news uh, providers and get an earful every day. But at the, at the end of the day, it does allow us to openly debate and air our differences in order to resolve or in order to forge uh, durable public policy. Is that, is that what you stipulate, uh, Congressman Rossman? Yeah, and I, and I think it's important to re to, for us to remember, even at this troubled season, this difficult season that we've been going through in our democracy, the United States is the only country in the world that's based on an idea. We're the only one. Every other country is based on an ethnicity or geography or a common language or something else. Soviet Union was based on an idea. Turned out it was a bad idea and it didn't last. Our idea, it's a great idea that we're the beneficiaries of. And now, now, as we're moving forward, we've got to be not defensive about the things that has made the United States um, so unique and so special historically. And even go to President Xi's criticism, where he says, look, you guys can't make up your minds about whether you want to be in the climate accords, you want to be out of the climate accords. Yeah. That that we, we've got the prerogative to change our mind over time and 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 to be back at this. But you you look at how all these things net out, and I think that the U.S. the underlying structure here is still strong and dynamic and ultimately invitational. You know, Understood. I, and I I think Peter raised such an important point. One of the things that's that's that I'm not sure we communicate effect effectively and we appreciate is that that idea that Peter talked about was an idea that the individuals have the right to self-governance and that the purpose of governance is to preserve the individual rights. And among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And we enshrine the mechanisms for doing that in our bill of rights and in the pro protocols established in the constitution. But what's so interesting and important is that we hold these truths to be self-evident about our system protecting the rights of the individual and the framers of our system were desperately concerned about not having autocrats and dictators like kings uh, or autocrats run the country because those folks inevitably impose their will on the rights and the interests of the individuals. And that is a fundamental systemic conflict. And we've been pushing America at that value around the world. And it's really an interesting and important challenge. How do we in, instill that and, and expand that? Because we think it's, it's the best idea when countries are ruled by autocrats who will suppress the very freedoms that we hold so dear. The question for me, and I think for the free world and for the future is, how can we help encourage and persuade leaders of powerful and great countries like China, Russia, et cetera, that they can still do lots of wonderful things, but their people and they themselves will ultimately be better off and the planet will be better off if we encourage the free exchange of ideas and that we risk public criticism because that criticism criticism can make us a better country and better people. You know, it, Brian has just said something about, I just got to jump in. It's so interesting sure. to me as he was, as he was laying out the language of the Declaration of Independence, you know, the language of, you know, this self, this self-evident, um, it just reminded me that he and I served in an institution that <clears throat> was designed to be in conflict with two other branches of government by design. Why? Our founders had such a low view of human nature. They understood human nature. They rejected a monarchy for the reasons that we know about. Our founders rejected a parliamentary system because they didn't want to have one faction gain control of everything with no restraint. So what did they do? They created this completely unique system of governance that we're so familiar with, these three co-equal branches that don't trust one another as far as they can throw one another. What George Bush and Barack Obama and Donald Trump and Joe Biden all have in common is they really don't like Congress. <laughs> I mean, no president really does. And there is part of this, this, this secret, this restraining influence and this forcing of trying to build consensus. And our founders basically said, look, if you can't, really when it comes down to it, if you can't come to consensus about something, 
you're not going to be able to do it. That's really what it comes down to. And, and so folks that have a high expectation of the ease with which you're able to get things done in Washington are often disappointed, as they should be. It's supposed to be hard to govern. It's supposed to be restrained. And there's a great benefit to that. There's one thing worse than gridlock. And the worst thing is the greased shoot of government, I would argue. Yeah, well, Bob, can, I add, can I have one more point? Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead really, Congressman. Particularly with it, with this with this group, we're privileged to talk to. We we run a risk, I think. We, the broader free freedom loving people of the of the world, when when we become dependent on a less uh, open society for either the supply of needed materials or purchasing the products of our, of our enterprise or agriculture, et cetera. And one of the challenges and opportunities of our American business leaders is to not just negotiate agreements for how we, how we procure materials and products from China or how we sell our products into China. That's important. We re respect that. But there must also be some fundamental premise of, look, if you exist as a successful American company, or you exist because of those freedoms. And it's incumbent upon you morally and economically and philosophically to, to respect those and convey the importance of those as part of your business activities. That's my belief. If we just say, we'll do anything or say anything or not say anything in order to maintain the supply chain or the, or the marketplace, then we're beginning a very, very dangerous process where you compromise fundamental values for the sake of short-term or even long-term economic gain. And so I think that's been a problem and I think it continues to be a problem and it's a gut check for our, our economic and, and business leaders who are functioning in the international economy. I don't think it's simple, but I think if we try to, if we neglect those core values of democratic ideals, we are selling the future short in ways that will hurt us in the long run. You're getting into an area that I do want to pivot to, which is uh, both trade policy and industrial policy, as it were, for the United States. As you know, there's the, the tariffs that the Trump administration uh, imposed that I mentioned in my opening uh, introduction that have been continued in the, under the Biden administration have been a recurring source of friction between uh, US and China. So my question to you both is, you know, we've, 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 we created the global order of free trade. We set up a system of free trade to which we invited China. We encouraged our own companies to be part of this global trading system. Yet at the same time, and I think you had, had adverted to this, uh, Congressman Baird, uh, you know, there are unique differences now. If you were to take a, you know, go to, to Beijing versus, let's just say, and I'm just picking a city here, Detroit, in terms of uh, the quality of infrastructure that we see in the United States. And we know that you know, part of uh, the bill that just got recently enacted by both houses of Congress and uh, signed into law by President Biden is supposed to uh, promote more spending on domestic infrastructure by US firms. Have we made an error in the way we've approached globalization of our economy with China in terms of basically putting at risk our own system based upon the lack of attention to our own, uh, our own infrastructure? Uh, Peter, you want to take it or shall I? Sure. Um, you know, thinking about Bob going into the WTO, for example, um, the, those, those relationships that uh, I said were pretty clear eyed at the time or the expectations, it was based on the premise that intellectual property was going to be secure and that currencies were gonna be played square you know, uh, across the framework. When I was in Congress, I represented a constituency outside of Chicago that was that large industrial base, small manufacturers near O'Hare Airport. And I mean, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of tool and die makers and so forth that were on the kind of the, the wrong end of the China question. And there were times when they would make complaints and they were perceived as being illegitimate in their complaints about Chinese competition. In other words, oh, if you worked harder, if you were more sophisticated, if you were smarter, if you invested more and were more forward-leaning in technology, you'd be able to compete too. Well, as it turns out, 
they've been exonerated largely. You know, it turns out they were they were right in their criticism, and the intellectual property was being stolen. We've seen you know technology transfer uh, either implicitly, you know, based on state power that the Chinese are are, are requiring for. Western companies to go in and sell into China, or it, it, it happens through corporate espionage and so forth, but as a matter, as a matter of policy. So I think, you know, Brian's, Brian's observation about the, the, the temptation to sort of sell the future short is an interesting one, and I agree with him. I think what could end up happening, and it, and it maybe isn't happening yet, but you know how that there's a a, a growing discussion on Wall Street and with regulators about um, ESG, environmental, social, and governance issues, you could see maybe in the next several years an emerging discussion that among some in the marketplace about China in particular. We see that with the, the question about the Uyghurs, and that's becoming you know a, a, a significant point of, of contention. But you know, I, I think it's in both countries' best interest to kind of lower the wattage so that we're not, uh, this, this doesn't become the zero-sum game that, that you warned against in, um, in, in some of the earlier discussion. Yeah, I think, Bear, go ahead. Yeah, one of the other things, there's been a lot of talk, especially with the Summit for Democracy, about to what extent can the free world democracies deal with the economic uh, dependencies that, that we've created, again, both on the supply end and the, the marketplace. And I think we actually have to. I think we have to say, look, it, we are fools if we allow something like all chip manufacturing to be in one way or another pretty dependent on China. And we're not very wise if we do the same with other natural resources, be it energy or, or defense technologies, et cetera, or, or bioengineering or supercomputing, et cetera. I think it's going to have to be a, a, an alliance of the progressive free world democracies to say, look, we are going to tie directly our political human rights values to our economic activities, and we're going to create structures, collaborative structures, infrastructure that allows us to be less dependent on these autocratic regimes so that if we have to take a difficult economic stand for the sake of principle, we not, we're not in, 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 in inclined to reduce, to sacrifice our principles for our economics. And, and I think we need to do that. It's, we, as Peter said earlier, you know, when we, when things first opened up, we were really hopeful. We had this idea, we'll bring Chinese students into America. They'll embrace not only our technology and we'll share it openly with them. We gave tons of PhDs and engineering degrees to Chinese students. And the theory was they'd go back and pr promote democracy. Many of them did. And many of them got killed in Tiananmen. Now, how dare I even say that, right? The fact that that's dangerous to say, that historical event documented on television around the world happened, but you can't talk about it in China. But that lesson said to all those people who came here and watched America grow and said, we want to have those democratic values. We want to have those freedoms. We want to have our say in the government. They learned they can get killed for doing it. And we have to somehow wrestle with that both our values and our economics, or it won't, or we're in trouble. That may be one of the post-COVID lessons, don't you think? Where um, you know there was this sense of vulnerability on PPE and and some other things, and it just sent a shudder through everybody. And we began to think through, you know, now supply chains at Christmas are part of the conversation. Where are things coming from, and and where things are sourced, and extractive minerals, and 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 um, you know all of these things come together in a way that even as the US and other Western economies are become somewhat more mercantilistic than we've seen in the past, there's, there's an interest in, in having a deeper understanding about some of the realities of these supply chain questions. And that goes right at Brian's point, whether it's a value-based decision that he articulated a minute ago, it's, or it's an economic decision, or it's a national security decision, it all suggests um, an increased awareness that I think our colleagues in, in Congress, our former colleagues, are sensing an increased awareness, an increased interest at the source of an, a number of products and how it manifests the life of, you know, er, er, everyday citizens in our country. Yeah, let me, let me, let me follow, follow up on that a little bit. Yeah, and I'm familiar with a lot of the critical minerals uh, discussions that uh, you've referenced uh, 
Congressman Roskam, uh, particularly in clean energy. I do know that you know, the United States used to have some of the biggest uh, uh, deposit, uh, 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 mineral deposits of critical minerals 20 years ago, but we got out of the business for two reasons. One is we didn't want to take the steps to make sure that they were being produced in an environmentally benign way. But also they were, we pushed a lot of our companies to go to China to get those uh, manufactured components through minerals sourced in China because they were cheaper, because we wanted to accelerate our clean energy uh, transition at the time. Now, having said that, we're now you know, in the process of com completely rethinking that paradigm, but hasn't, been, hasn't that been kind of the, 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 the bed that we created ourselves where we, we find ourselves sort of coming and going at this point? You know, Bob, it's been more than 20 years ago, but the head of Intel wrote a piece in Business Week with one of the most prescient things I've ever seen. And he said, look, essentially, I paraphrased less elegantly than he said it, but he basically said, look, we are under, a, it turns out, possibly naive belief that the free enterprise, free market will always prevail no matter what. And he said, but that is running headlong into a mercantilist economy in, in, in an autocracy in the form of China that is taking our technology, the intellectual capability, either take it because we give it away or stealing it, and then backing that through very long-term strategic government subsidies and support, even as it tries to suppress our access to the, the very materials that we need. And in the process, for example, he gave the example of batteries. So we develop the technology and the science here, the manufacturing goes there, then their scientists and engineers deal with that manufacturing on a daily basis, and pretty soon they've got more capability in the manufacturing end, and we are now completely dependent on a foreign country for a technology that emerged from our scientists and engineers. And he said, and you combine that process with mercantilist subsidies, with hidden subsidies of more lax environmental regulations, human right laws, property rights, et cetera. And there's real question about whether just free market laissez-faire capitalism can compete against that. And if we don't recognize that, that, that that new reality, uh, we may be very surprised at how that competition turns out. Do you think, let me ask you both then, that's, a, that's an excellent observation, uh, particularly given the, the as, as I said, the bipartisan infrastructure bill, which is intended to bring a lot of uh, manufacturing uh, and sourcing back to the United States. Are we slowly creeping into more of a I wouldn't say planned e economic system, but more of a government managed economy as opposed to relying purely on the decisions made by the free market at this point in order to address national security uh, and economic security concerns. I think there's an ebb and flow from a strategic point of view. I think one of the hard lessons is <clears throat> this notion of a regulatory regime that gets created in the United States that becomes very, very difficult to do to do business here. And so you end up chasing, you know, chasing economic activity off, off to somewhere else. And there's, a, I, I think that we can find a sweet spot. I think that there is a reasonable regulatory regime that makes sense, that is environmentally wise from a steward, stewardship perspective, but also recognizes, look, the world's gonna create some of these products and it's gonna be better if, if we're involved in creating them. And I think it, it let, me, let me just take a step further back and kind of open the aperture up for a little bit of a wider discussion because my sense is that both political parties are, um, are struggling right now, not with the China question per se, but really struggling with what's America's role in the world? What, what are we supposed to be doing? How are we supposed to be cutting? Uh, uh, conducting ourselves. Brian and I, I think, would, rec would, would represent sort of the core historic Republican and Democrat perspective, you know, coming together and saying, look, the U.S. has a significant role in the world. We are a leader and we need to assume that role and uh, along, along with our allies and, and so forth. Pretty, you know, you, you can make a bumper sticker pretty easy. We both put it on our cars. Where it becomes more challenging is within both political parties, there are voices that say, they're, they're isolationist voices. They're basically saying, um, you know what? I, I'm, there's folks in my party, the Republican party, that say, 
it's too expensive to be involved in the world. We should cut all that stuff. We shouldn't be spending money on foreign aid and all these foreign offices, close them down. And it's a complete waste of money. That's a bad assertion, but there are people in my party that think that. People in Brian's party <clears throat> think, well, um, who are we to tell anybody how to live? We're, 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 not, we're not the country that we purport to be. We don't have the ability, we don't have the moral right to have, to have anybody. And you can hear those voices as well. But what, the, the, what becomes troublesome is when both those voices for different reasons find common ground to say, yep, US needs to pull back <clears throat> and we're motivated by different things, but the US needs to pull back. I would argue, and I think I'm speaking for Brian, that would be a strategic mistake. It would be, it would be terrible beyond all measure. The US needs to be present in the world, <clears throat> you know, in a humble, gracious way, but the we we need to be present on the world stage and asserting these things and 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 making claims about individual rights and individual liberties. Because if it if if that voice isn't made. Uh, then it, it, it doesn't take long for, for it to become very quiet very quickly. Yeah, absolutely. Beautifully said, Peter. I, I would add one word to humble, gracious, and I would, that would be resolute. And, and, and I, I think it does not serve us well when we have bombastic people insulting leaders from around the world. I don't think that serves us well. I think the personal attack is not usually constructive, albeit there are some people who I think deserve it from time to time. But we're better when we talk about ideas, we're better when we talk about shared interests, and we're better when we look at the long term. You know, one of the pieces of rhetoric that, back to your initial question, Bob, is, you know, there's a rhetoric that is, the government doesn't pick winners and losers economically. Well, if we just let another country that does pick winners and losers pick the winners, then we've just picked the losers by not picking. And the losers are going to be our American industries and jobs. We are going to have to work together and have some, by, by the together, I mean both Democrats and Republicans work together. And then I mean together the broader free enterprise, free democracy world to work together to say, look, we've got to make sure that we do plan and we do make wise decisions and we're not embarrassed to, to collaborate and sometimes even subsidize because if the opposition's getting subsidized, and our people aren't, as Peter pointed out earlier, our people are gonna lose. And, and we may have some ideological belief that, oh, no, no, laissez-faire, hands-off capitalism, uh, or we may have an ideological view that says that hands-off capitalism means businesses are free to just pursue the business interest and to hell with democratic values. Neither of those are gonna serve us well. Well stated, and I can tell you, having spent time overseas, on behalf of the US government, not just China, but you have European governments that have entire ministries dedicated to helping their businesses thrive overseas. We do the same thing, but not nearly to the same degree as we see from European countries. And so let me do this. We do have a few minutes for uh, questions from our audience, but I'm gonna plant a stake in the ground and reserve the opportunity to ask both of you one last final question at the very end. But for now, let me turn to Charles and Charles, if you could uh, begin um, looking at uh, the questions and uh, telling us what some of the uh, questioners are asking uh, these two gentlemen. Charles? Absolutely. Thank you, Robert. Uh, our first question comes in over email. With the recent decision by the U.S. to boycott U.S. officials from attending the upcoming Olympics in China, how much of an impact will that have on U.S.-China relations? Who wants to go first on that really simple question? Mm -hmm. Well, I, okay. I, go, go ahead, ahead, Brian, please. All right. I, I actually think it's a, a fairly wise decision. I think you have to say that while we have these egregious human rights abuses uh, occurring, uh, we don't want to condone that. We don't want to pretend everything's back to normal. That doesn't mean we're not communicating with folks and it doesn't penalize the athletes. And, and it's, I think it's a, it's a reasonable approach at this point. I think if it were only in isolation and we didn't do some back channel uh, efforts to improve relationships and promote more democratic values in China, then we're, we're missing something because we can't just be conflict in this. I think that's right. I think it's a I, I, I think it's a balanced approach. It doesn't give the imprimatur of approval on everything that's going on <clears throat> in Beijing, and it reserves the right to continue to criticize. And, and as we know, it's gotten a lot of attention. Those are those symbols 
matter in that context. And the symbolism of that is not lost on the Chinese leadership. To Brian's point, it doesn't penalize the athletes who everyone is sympathetic towards. And um, it, it could be a foreshadowing of other sorts of things to come down the road. Great, next question, Charles. Our next question comes in the Q&A box. Can you address international scientific collaboration more narrowly? How can we change our government's attitude towards Chinese academics? Well, you know, I spent a lot of time, I chaired the science committee and I, I worked a lot on science diplomacy. And the idea was around the world, people admire America for its democratic values, but also for its te technological prowess. One of the things that was most interesting to me is I would travel the world. I went through the Middle East and some Asian countries as well, South America. And we talked to people, and one of the things that was most admired about American academic research institution was merit. It was that you're not rewarded in our system because you adhere to a political party line or because you're a family member of some rich and powerful person. If you have evidence and a methodology that works, you are moved up our system by virtue, not by, by relationship or party ideology. And I think we need to strengthen and expand that. And, and, and uh, the challenge for us now is we did all these scientific exchanges. We brought in many, many students from abroad. And as I mentioned earlier, that did not necessarily lead to democratization. And it led in some cases to increased competition. So I think we're going to have to, one, constrain that to some extent, because we have, we have a, a national interest in preserving some of our intellectual property. And I think we may have to constrain that. And I think we're going to have to maybe uh, 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 rebuild some of the things that we thought we, were going to work in the relationships. We can't just say, come on in, we'll give us all your knowledge, you go back home and, uh, and then compete with us. The, the, for, the, or the, the forum where this is becoming manifest is in, in genetics uh, right now. The, the, uh, the United States and China are fiercely competing for the ability for genetic sequencing and, and, and understanding the next wave of, of genetics. And um, just within the past week or so, there was a Chinese company that lost a case in California, a federal infringement case, um, based on just stealing technology. So this, this um, collaboration is terrific insofar as it's a shared value. It's not terrific if it's not a shared value. Yep. Let, let, me, let me offer my own perspective on behalf of the Committee of 100. And I understand the, the, the issues and the, and the positions each of you have espoused. One of the co-founders of our organization was a nuclear physicist who, who played a key role uh, in the Manhattan Project at its early, very early. She was known as the, Marie, the Chinese Marie Curry, a Chinese immigrant who came to the United States who brought knowledge and was able to help develop the nuclear, just the, our, the nuclear weapons capability of the United States that led to the civilian uh, technology that we, we know of and use today. So how do we, how do we safeguard our, our, our knowledge base and our intellectual property and our research institutions and protect them uh, in terms of uh, maintaining integrity so that they aren't the subject of theft, while at the same time, keeping our doors open to people like her, who actually bring knowledge or bring a capability that might not we might not be able to uh, grow uh, indigenously. Is there a balance we need to strike? There is, but getting to that balance is the big is is the big challenge. I mean, unfortunately, there's there's. There's great loss in terms of productivity one way or the other until that balance is struck. Because on the one hand, you can hemorrhage intellectual property. On the other hand, you can shun people who have a good faith uh, uh, desire to, to, to actively participate in scientific inquiry. And it is a, it is a difficult conundrum. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't have an easy answer. Well, part of the solution is we don't engage in xenophobic hatred of foreigner rhetoric, and we don't engage in racist rhetoric, uh, and and that is really destructive. When uh, and I've talked to people internationally, say I used to want to come to America, but I don't anymore, and that's where we lose. And it's not just the the Chinese relationship; it's it's relationships with India, it's relationship with countries or Middle East around the world. 
if we bring, if we are welcoming that talent from around the world and giving and providing ways for people to stay here, you know, the old green card to every engineer or scientist, that helps. Now, my understanding of the China situation is they hold levers to keep people from staying abroad, and we sometimes prevent it. But we need to be more open to more people who will work with us, but maybe a little less open to people who will be under the thumb of someone and, and compete against us. No, and I, you make a great observation, Congressman Baird. Uh, I'm aware that there are a lot of U.S. citizens who emigrated from mainland China who currently play a major role in academia and in a lot of our research institutions. So they're here. They came here to study, but they stayed. Yeah. And as Tom Friedman likes to be quoted as saying, you know, for every Ph.D. we issue to a foreign student, there ought to be a green card stapled to it. We ought to welcome uh, that uh, that uh, that the, these very talented individuals and find a place for them to contribute to the betterment of the United States. And we have to recognize that there are really smart people all around the country and in big countries with billions of people, uh, uh, there's a whole lot of smart people in those countries, especially when yes. they work and study hard. Yes, so, some, of, some of the founders of our, uh, our modern technology come both from mainland China and from Russia. Oddly yeah. enough, uh, they, they, they fled uh, persecution and they're here now. Let right. me, uh, Charles, we've got time for maybe one or two more questions. Sure. Uh, in, back to the email. In the recent virtual meeting, President Xi called President Biden a, quote, old friend. But the White House publicly pushed back on that, saying they were not old friends. Big deal, little deal, or no deal? <laughs> Who wants well, to take that question? Back to, I think it goes back to the point Peter made. I think we need a little more humility in our leaders. And, and this is the problem. When, you, when you're trying to conduct major foreign policy and you're, and you're doing that in a state, in a political stage, uh, I, I, I would hate to date someone uh, and have everybody film the date. I, you know, you've got to build a relationship and that, that's a personal thing. And, and this have the relationship and then see how I can posture on one side or the other doesn't work very well. And we ought to just agree when we have these things. Look, I'm not going to say anything when we leave here. How about you don't say anything and we just, we just move on. I'd rather see that than the posturing myself on either side, either country's side. Yeah, I, I don't make too much of, of old friend, not old friend, and so forth. I, I just think it's it's language, and most people, you know, dismiss it as uh, exactly that sort of posturing. I wouldn't make too much of it. Let me do this. Uh, Charles, you have time for one more question, and then, as I said, I've got one last question I'd like to pose to these two gentlemen, but go ahead, Charles. Final question from the Q&A box. Given the concerns you have expressed about the lack of political rights, free speech, et cetera, inside China, what reliable, credible cooperation do you think is possible between Washington and Beijing, specifically on climate? Well, I think there's a case where we, we have technologies we can share. And, and, and I think we, we need to find those technologies. And we need to have some kind of way that the trading relationship is fair. So that if we have American technologies and we and manufacturing, they're not just undermined by unfair trade and, uh, and labor practices. So it's in our national and international interest to get the climate thing right. Uh, that's going to be hard given 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 the political investment in in dirty technologies in both countries. Yeah, I think that's right. And basically, the the West is sort of saying to some of, in the in the lesser developed countries, and I wouldn't put China in that category as lesser developed, but. But you know, we basically built out our economy, and others that want to do build out their economies, we're we're sort of stiff arming them and creating a, a new standard. Again, it's it is it's easier it's easier said than done. Um, and I think I, if I were to take one one approach, it would try to to break these things down into you know smaller steps rather than saying you know these these massive goals that are that are just sound like platitudes after a while. Instead say, let's come to agreement on, on this particular uh, energy source or this particular output or this particular technology and take it one step at a time. I think we could also agree on things that, that are common interest. Like if we could jointly work on carbon capture and sequestration, something like that, that's in the shared best interest of everybody. Yes, and China has enormous coal capability where that technology is going to have to be utilized if we genuinely want to make a difference in carbon mitigation globally. So let me let me end uh, 
our discussion with one final question to you both. And I'll, I'll begin this with a quote. This is a quote that was, met, that was uttered by um, uh, uh, Stephen Olson, who's a senior research fellow at the Hendrick Foundation at the conclusion of the summit. And this is his quote. The open question for the broader relationship is whether the US and China can constructively manage the slow motion collision that is now unfolding between their very different worldviews. So my question to you both is, do you agree that we are on a slow motion collision? And if so, is there anything that could be done? And any other parting thoughts either of you may have to close out our discussion today? So since I started with Congressman Baird at the beginning, let me turn to Congressman uh, Ross, Roscombe to close us out. Well, like Brian and I shared, <clears throat> our worldview at the very beginning was pretty abundant and buoyant about the United States, notwithstanding, you know, notwithstanding the challenges that we've, that we've stipulated to. But I think that um, you know, us moving forward in the, in the Chinese context, we need to be faithful to the values that are, that are in, important to us and the, the values that have, that have made um, our country this special, special place. You know, they, the, um, the movie Chariots of Fire is a, is a fun movie and it's this, I won't go into all the details, but it's about an Olympian who is being asked to do something in conflict with his conscience and in con conflict with his faith, and he ultimately wouldn't do it. And as a result, he, he switched events and performed and was a gold medal winner. But the point of that is that he stuck with the things that were, uh, that, that, that were life-giving for him. And I think we in the United States have been pushed around a little bit. You know, we pushed ourselves around, and now we're in a time of, of reflection. And we would do well to recognize that our place on the world stage is not guaranteed. And we need to be um, clear and uh, understanding of these core values that have, that have made the US such a special place and also be inclusive in trying to, to invite others to see the benefits of that. So are we on a collision course? You know, you'd have to be pretty naive, I think, to say that, say that we're not on our, on our current trajectory. But it's our hope that these can be redirected over time. Carson Baird, close us out, please. I think Peter said it. I mean, we've got to, to, we are in a serious competition, ideologically, militarily, economically. The fate of the freedoms we hold dear might be at stake. We want to expand those and encourage the Chinese government and other governments to embrace them as well. But we can't be naive about that. We, can't, we have to be very sophisticated and very dedicated and very resolute, as I said earlier. And importantly, it can't just be government to government. In the global economy, we need businesses and industries and economic powerhouses to be part of that process of protecting liberalized economic values and liberalized democracy values. And I hope this group will be part of that. I, I know they will and have done much already, but I think that's an enduring task for all of us. Congressman Baird, Congressman Roscoe, on behalf of the Committee 100 and the Association of Former Members of Congress, I want to thank both of you. These two gentlemen are tremendous thought leaders and an asset to our country. I want to thank all of our uh, guests for watching us this afternoon. I hope that you were able to learn a great deal about this very important subject. I did. And I want to thank all of you for being here today. Uh, and I turn the floor over back to uh, Charles to uh, basically sign us out. Charles? That concludes today's event. A replay of the event will be available in approximately 24 hours. To get more information on Committee of 100, visit committeeof100.org. To get more information on FMC, visit usafmc.org. Thank you. Th thank you.